Good afternoon. Welcome to ASAM's first National Perspectives Plenary Session. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Goldsmith, President of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. I sincerely hope you're enjoying the conference so far. The National Perspectives Plenary Session was created to provide the opportunity for leaders of federal agencies who are seated here to address emerging issues and advances in addiction medicine. The first half hour of the session will feature short 10-minute high-level presentations from each of our distinguished leaders, followed by 30 minutes of question and answer moderated by Dr. Michael Fingerhood, the chair of the Annual Conference Program Planning Committee. If you would like to submit a question, please open your annual conference app on one of your devices and find the National Perspectives Plenary Session. You will notice a small button with conversation bubbles called polling inside the session. So you got to get to the session, you got to go inside the session. Simply tap the polling button and then tap ask questions to submit your question. Please submit them throughout this session. So the first half hour, you can put in your question. If you're not familiar with the app like me, that may be a little confusing to follow it all, but I think we can get through it. It is my honor to now introduce our distinguished guests. Ms. Connie Namoto is currently serving as Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Dr. George Kube is currently serving as Director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Dr. Wilson Compton is currently serving as Deputy Director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And Dr. Michael Fingerhood is the Chair of the ASAM Annual Conference Program Planning Committee and is responsible for the Annual Conference Program here in New Orleans. He is also Associate Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Presenting first is Ms. Connie Nomoto on behalf of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Ser Services Administration. Please join me in wel welcoming Ms. Inamoto. Thank you very much. I, I, I know he had to really pause because he wasn't going to say doctor. Uh, <laughs> um, but, and I know, I know so many of you guys, uh, or all of you guys, are doctors. And I appreciate you um, having me here uh, to represent the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, we have had a fantastic year. And, um, and I, here we go. I found the thing to change the slides. Um, so like I was saying, we've, we've had a lot of change. Secretary Price came out to visit SAMHSA uh, on Wednesday. Um, I took a red eye from Seattle to DC so that I could be there. And uh, it was really interesting. It was great. He shared with us that uh, three of his top clinical priorities for HHS uh, are opioids, serious mental illness, and childhood obesity. So those are his top three. Uh, which uh, is, is very good news for us. It's, it's good news for all of us that that's going to be uh, um, an urgent priority for the administration, uh, for the secretary, for the department, and obviously uh, for SAMHSA. Um, and um, we're excited. I think it means we're going to continue to press on this issue. I think there may be some changes in, in some of the policy directions. Um, secretary Price is a very engaged secretary. As you know, he's an orthopedic surgeon, uh, 20 years as a practicing physician, 20 years as a, an elected official, uh, and now secretary of HHS, only uh, one of three uh, individuals uh, to be secretary of HHS and be a doctor. Um, and so uh, Secretary Price is very enthusiastic uh, about leaning in uh, and uh, putting his um, 
uh, putting his uh, overlay uh, on our policy directions, and we're excited to be working with him. Um, so I was at a meeting with our staff, and I shared with them a proverb that I had heard. It says, in times of great winds, some build bunkers, others build windmills. And it was, a, it was actually at a Parity Policy Academy, uh, which the department also supported us in holding. We were hosting uh, 10 states to look at uh, Medicaid and CHIP uh, application of Parity. Uh, we're also going to be having uh, hosting 20 states to look at commercial insurance and how to implement Parity there. Um, and uh, so that the, a staff person came up to me afterwards and was like, thanks for doing the opening remarks at the Parity Policy Academy. Everyone used your windmill analogy as a charge. We're building windmills. We're going. Uh, and then he said, but I hope you're not offended. The staff went upstairs, and they're like, we don't care what she said. We're building bunkers. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's just acknowledging that there is a lot of change happening. There are great wins. Um, but I think all of you are here because you are windmill builders, right? You have your practices, you have your research, you have uh, your administrative roles, uh, but you're looking to learn more. You're looking to see what's next. You know, I'm just walking in here. I almost didn't make it in here because those posters are so fantastic. I, like, took a picture of one. I was like, I knew we should do smoking cessation in our PPW programs. We're going to require it. 53% of those women stayed non-smoking after they left their program, so we're doing it. Um, but, but this is, so, you know, this is a gathering of the willing. This is a gathering of the people who are looking over the hill, what's next. Uh, and so I'm happy to be able to share with you a little bit about what's happening uh, at SAMHSA. Um, so in December, uh, President Obama signed into law the 21st Century Cures Act, which had implications uh, for our colleagues at NIH, our colleagues at FDA, uh, but quite a few implications for SAMHSA. We were um, our tiny little, you know, 700-person agency, $3.7 billion. We were reauthorized. Uh, it did establish uh, in statute our Center for Behavioral Health Statistics and Quality. It did create the position of an assistant secretary for mental health and substance use in the department. Uh, that person would have the roles and authorities of the SAMHSA administrator, so there's no more SAMHSA administrator. We now have an assistant secretary, and that sort of elevates uh, and raises the visibility of our issues in the department. Function it's kind of the same thing. Uh, but, you know, we're excited and other people in the department are very excited uh, for mental health and substance use to have that uh, kind of um, recognition in the organizational structure uh, of HHS. Uh, the other big thing that many of you may know about is that CURES authorized uh, and then uh, the appropriators funded um, half a billion dollars in 2017 with a commitment to another half billion dollars in 2018 for a billion dollar uh, opioid uh, state targeted response grant. So in recognition of the incredible uh, crisis that we're seeing around opioid overdose around the country, uh, the, the administration and the Congress agreed, and the Congress with an overwhelming majority, 95 to 4 vote in the Senate, um, said we want to tackle this issue and we want to address the treatment gap. And so these grants are going out to states. We had 57 out of 59 eligible entities, states and territories apply for those grants. We hope to get those monies out and flowing uh, before the end of the month. Uh, so it's really sort of a record, um, uh, record speed, like land speed record that a federal agency is able to get like the law in place, the announcement out, the state supplied, the money out the door and into the field uh, in a span of four months. Um, so we're really, really, really excited to be working with our partners at the states and in the communities uh, to get that money out. We're also happy that our colleagues at the institutes are, and, and Wilson will talk about it, are also leaning in, looking at what are the research questions uh, that we can answer with this opportunity, uh, talking to our friends at CDC, uh, what are the surveillance and public health issues that we can help address uh, as the states get this funding. Um, so this is uh, an important recognition of how vital uh, what you do is. I think the, the fact that we got this vote of confidence uh, from Congress, from the President, that uh, we can try to tackle this issue. You know, in FY16, I had the opportunity to testify in front of Congress six times. Uh, I would say most of this, like five out of six were not so friendly. Um, and so I had congressmen just leaning down over the podium, yelling at me, saying, substance abuse treatment doesn't work. What are you doing about it? I have had constituents who've gone to treatment six times, and every time they go in, they come out, they relapse. They go in, they come out, they relapse. And I mean, it breaks my heart to hear that that's happened to anybody, uh, much less Congressman Cole's constituent. Um, 
<laughs> but, um, you know, it, I ask them, I'm like, but when you say treatment doesn't work, you know, to what are you referring? And when they describe, well, it's, you know, it's, it's a detox and then a, a shot and, and a phone number for an NA group. Um, and, and I say, that's not what we consider treatment, right? We need to get, we, uh, you know, and I actually referenced the ACM guidelines. I said, there are professional guidelines that tell us what is the gold standard for treatment, what is the best practice. And I would say many, many people in this country aren't getting it, but those who do get it, do get better. And we know this can happen. If we, do, if we do the right prevention, if we do the right treatment, if we do the right recovery supports, if we do it with evidence-based, you know, medically supported clinical practice, uh, we can and we do make, help people get better all the time. That message, I think, got through, and that's why they gave us a billion dollars to try to address this problem. And so I thank you guys uh, for the fantastic work that you're doing, for the research, uh, for the clinical work, and the leadership that you're providing, because if that didn't happen, uh, they wouldn't have had this faith in us. Um, that's opioids SDR. Another uh, in exciting program that happened, uh, uh, or law that got signed into place last year, was the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act. With that, Congress gave us $17 million. We don't know exactly uh, which uh, priorities Congress is, is going to ask us to fund, uh, but there are some important opportunities there with overdose prevention, uh, pregnant postpartum women, uh, outpatient and residential programming, uh, recovery supports, uh, some prevention work, uh, and others. But very important piece in the CARA Act was the expansion of buprenorphine prescribing to uh, MPs and PAs, the mid-level professionals. And uh, starting in February, um, again, you know, SAMHSA has really had like the pedal to the floor <laughs> over the last year. Uh, we got our trainings out and with our partners uh, so that we could start people signing up uh, uh, to um, do their trainings uh, in February. And so thanks to all of the folks who were involved in getting that to happen in record speed. We are really, really excited uh, to see this. And we think the dovetailing of uh, the timing uh, of, of mid-levels coming online and the infusion of uh, new dollars coming into the field is, is really uh, um, serendipitous. Um, I know you guys uh, heard from Dr. Murthy uh, this morning. I'm sorry you didn't get to see him in person. For those of you who have been around Vivek, he just has like a really peaceful aura around him. <laughs> so he's, he is as wonderful as he seems. Uh, and uh, he has been an incredible advocate for us and, and for you and will continue to be uh, in his tenure. We've, I'm sure he's told you all the uptake he's gotten. Um, and uh, the important thing um, one of the important things that they talk about in the report uh, is, is about changing the conversation. And I just want to leave you with this. I, I, I uh, came from a, a meeting, uh, actually three different folks were saying, we have to use the SG report and the science that we have to get insurers to create uh, a gold standard product. Uh, what, is the, what, is the, what is like a benchmark plan that they could be offering? Um, and I said, yeah, we should do that. And I've talked to some of the insurers and the managed care companies, and they're happy to work with us to do that. And then they, but they say, you have to be working with the purchasers, right? Because we, you know, we could offer whatever product you want. Someone has to be willing to pay for it. Uh, but then when you talk to the purchasers, they say, well, but you have to have consumers who want it. So, you know, I think there is a, a, an important role for us in terms of changing the conversation. Some of the folks that I was talking to was like, well, we just need to go in with them and show them the ROI. Show them the ROI for treatment. Show them the ROI for recovery supports. Uh, and I said, you know, I think we should do that. Absolutely. We have great data that show that we can reduce the costs of, uh, that we can reduce the costs of uh, general health care, we can reduce criminal justice costs, we can improve educational outcomes, uh, and so on and so forth. However, I don't know that the money that's saved is always going to be saved by the insurance company. So if you go down a bean counter route, you have to know to which bean counter you're speaking, right? Um, and so it may not be uh, what we... It's just sort of a be careful what you wish for. Um, and I said, also, since when do we have to say that it's, there's ROI in doing a heart transplant? I have a good friend. He was 67 years old. He went to the Mayo Clinic. He, went, he got a heart transplant. 67-year-old man. Was there ROI on that? Did, did that save money? I don't think so. And not to be crass, but I mean, it would have been cheaper if he died. But that man is an esteemed academic. That man 
is a fantastic father, grandfather, a, a loved friend and colleague. He has quality of life, and they gave him a new heart because he wanted another 10 or 20 or 30 years of life. And that's why we do it. And I don't know why we think there should be any different an argument for substance use treatment. Right? Because what you're doing is not, you're not doing what you do to go save somebody else's money. You're doing what you do to save someone's son or daughter's life. And that should be compelling enough. Of course we have the data. We will share the data, but you guys are saving lives. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Enomoto, for your perspectives from SAMHSA. <laughs> I would like to present um, you with the plaque in recognition of your participation in ASAM's 48th uh, annual conference, National Perspectives Plenary Session. I would like now to invite Dr. George Kube to the podium for his presentation from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kube. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. You all know I love ASAM, um, especially when you hold your meetings in California. <laughs> But New Orleans is not bad. So I, I want to make a couple of points about some of the things that we find very exciting that we're doing at NIAAA. But before I do that, I want to remind you of something that has been, you've been reminded of all day. But while we lose people to the opioid addiction epidemic, we lose almost three times as many to alcohol every day. If you do a little calculation, it's 240 people die of some alcohol-related problem each day. And the other piece that I'd like to emphasize from this slide is the cost, which is up to $250 billion a year, but also that only about 20% of individuals with uh, a lifetime alcohol use disorder get any treatment for alcohol use disorder, and 10% and get pharmacotherapy. And so some of the issues that I'm going to discuss with you in the next very few minutes are going to be focused on that problem. Now we've just finished our strategic plan for the, last, for the next five years, not the last five years, but the next five years. And you know, it really focuses on our mission, which is diagnosis, prevention, and, and treatment for alcohol misuse. And that is the simple version of our mission. You know, identify mechanisms of alcohol action, alcohol-related pathology and recovery, improve diagnosis and tracking of alcohol misuse and alcohol use disorder and alcohol-related consequences, develop and improve strategies to prevent alcohol misuse, alcohol use disorder and alcohol-related consequences, and develop and improve treatments for alcohol misuse, alcohol use disorder, co-occurring conditions, and alcohol-related consequences. And then another big piece of our mission uh, is to enhance the public health impact of NIAAA-supported research. And if there's one thing that I think I've accomplished in the first three years of being director is that I really pushed our staff to re release and get out to the public and work with SAMHSA on what we do know about alcohol use disorders, about prevention, about diagnosis, and about treatment. And some of the exciting things that we're planning on doing, this is uh, largely focused on our intramural program for the moment, but we, we want to take a, a, a research domain criteria sort of approach. We call it uh, a, a, a neuroclinical assessment approach to diagnosis based on a framework that's it's actually part of the uh, framework in the Surgeon General's report of how we think about addiction. The hypothesis is that we can develop tests. Some might be imaging, some might be neuropsychological tests like are on this slide, such as delayed discounting or cure activity you heard from Dr. Mason about this morning. And maybe those, those tests can help us diagnose a, a, a substance use disorder, but in particular, alcohol use disorder. And, and we're working with NIDA on, on a very similar 
framework for their, their clinical trials network. The, the, the issue is, we, I don't expect that we're going to replace DSM-5. That's not the goal here. The goal is to augment uh, DSM-5, and, and the goal is also maybe at some point we'll be able to be able to predict who's going to respond to what treatment by a, an algorithm of neuropsychological tests or maybe even imaging. Um, we were a big part of, of the Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drugs, and health. You've heard a lot about that already today, but I think it really, as, as Dr. Murphy said the, this morning, one of the biggest benefits of this is is to reduce stigma and to have individuals understand that we're talking about, as he put so elegantly, a chronic illness. Um, we have a big program in integrating addiction medicine into medical education. We've been working with you all on this. Um, we supported a grant to SUNY Buffalo to translate addiction into clinical practice in collaboration with ABAM, American Board of Addiction Medicine. We paved the way for integration of addiction medicine into postgraduate medical um, education in 37 academic medical centers. Uh, this also provide, the ABAM provided a model for residency training in addiction medicine, laid the groundwork for recognition of addiction medicine as a subspecialty, and you know all this. But uh, we are currently engaged with other agency, including SAMHSA and, and NIDA, um, with the White House on a national effort to grow the addiction medicine workforce. And uh, the next steps are possibly to identify a medical school curriculum needs and enhance addiction medicine questions on medical board exams. So we're all collaborating on, on this effort. Um, one that you may not know about is that we had a collaboration with HBO on a documentary. It's called Risky Drinking. Uh, this is a, a it can, you can, see it on HBO, you have to pay for it right now. It's going to, we're going to show it at the American Psychological, uh, Psychiatric Association in San Diego this uh, coming May. We're going to also show it in June at the Research Society on Alcoholism meeting. Um, we may ultimately show it at CPDD. We haven't really gotten that far, but it's a no, no holds barred look at alcohol use disorder through the intimate stories of four people whose drinking dramatically affects a relationship. And it goes from young people who are binge drinking, or what I would call extreme binge drinking, all the way to what I would call a terminal alcoholic, someone who's just about dying in front of the camera. So it's, uh, I want to warn you, it's a downer. It's, it's not exactly something you want to watch um, to uplift your spirits, but it's a very compelling description of alcohol use disorder. We have a vibrant medications development program. I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but I just want to show you the next slide and then come back to the slide to make a point, which is we know through the neurobiology of addiction and neurobiology of alcohol use disorders that there are herds and herds of targets, targets that can return the brain to homeostasis from a motivational perspective. Some of the targets um, uh, act on on craving, some of the targets act on the withdrawal, and some of the targets act on the acute reinforcing effects or, or pleasurable effects of the drug. But um, translating those targets into medications and new medications, as you heard from Dr. Mason this morning, there haven't been any new medications developed for alcohol use disorder in over 10 years, is really a challenge. And so you heard about human laboratory screening this morning. Um, we're going to be doing more of that at NIAAA. We and NIDA have adjusted our SBIR, STTR program so that we can speed up the development of INDs. That's a new investigational drug application. You can't give those drugs I just showed you in the previous slide to people without an IND. Well, you can, but you're really going to be locked up. And, um, and then we have a, a, an NIAAA clinical investigation group. We, we have uh, successfully performed a number of, of multi-center clinical trials. One of them that came from the animal work was successful, which is a, an anti-stress medication. Not, it's a novel one, uh, vasopressin 1B antagonist. Um, so far, we haven't had any pharmaceutical industry particularly interested in further developing this compound, but we're, um, we're working in that domain as well. Um, alcohol is unique because alcohol causes lots of other problems. 
I don't know whether you noticed in that first slide I showed, but half of liver disease in this country, half of liver disease in this country is caused by alcohol. And some areas are, are much more dramatically affected than others. I was in Albuquerque a few weeks ago, and they presented data showing that, that the rate of alcohol liver disease in, in New Mexico is like four times the national average. It's extraordinary. And so we have a, series, a group of consortia that um, were there when I took over as director of NIAAA. My job was to make them meet together and love each other and coordinate um, some of their work, but we're trying to develop common definitions and standards for alcohol liver disease that can be used for clinical trials, um, mutually agreeable endpoints for clinical trials, and also to build collaboration and, and share uh, DNA samples so we can look at some of the genetic loading. For example, why, why is it that in New Mexico they have four times uh, the levels of alcoholic liver disease than other parts of the country? Um, this is something we're collaborating with ASAM and um, we will be uh, working with other agencies once we uh, finish the launch. We hope to have this out by mid-year, uh, somewhere in, in the middle of the summer this year. We're calling it the Treatment Navigator and it's gonna be a website initially and then maybe a hard copy uh, to assist people in finding alcohol use treatment, alcohol use disorder treatment. Um, and the idea is to produce a one-of-a-kind resource that'll outline the features of evidence-based uh, alcohol use disorder treatment, describe the very root, varied routes to recovery, that it's not just 28-day facility, as you heard from Kana and or AA, uh, provide tools for locating the most qualified treatment specialists. It'll have links up to ASAM and, and, and other organizations. And so we're really excited about this. We're, we're, um, we're at the final stages of getting to an initial launch. And I ask all of you, and I invite all of you to, to comment when it comes out, give us feedback, tell us if it's useful, tell us if we've gone in some wrong direction, tell us if we should be emphasizing different pieces. But I can't tell you how many phone calls how many emails that we get virtually every day asking for us, you know, somebody has a relative, we'll pick on Atlanta because Atlanta seems to be picked on at this meeting, um, you know, and needs, a, a, you know, they have a ulcerated um, gastrointestinal system from abusing alcohol and they're about, you know, they're bleeding and wh where do they go and where do they get treatment? So that's, that's just a, a, a very, quick snapshot of where we're going with NIAAA. I think we're on the verge of, a, of quite a few exciting new adventures in the field. Again, um, I want to emphasize to you that we'd like to translate what we're doing out to the real world. We intend to work very closely with SAMHSA and NIDA in this regard, and we really appreciate all your input. So any comments you have were, are welcome. Um, you're welcome to send me emails. God forbid if you all send me emails. But um, if I don't respond, then you send it again and I'll do my best. So thank you very much. Dr. Koop, thank you for being speaker today and thank you for your really creative and hard work on helping alcohol use disorder. Our last presenter is Dr. Wilson Compton on behalf of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Compton. Well, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. And I uh, uh, was trying to think about how, how do you organize a 10-minute talk to summarize uh, uh, you know, several decade old organization that has provided some of the basic findings that inform all of our work in the addiction field. And so I'm, I'm not going to try to do that. Um, what I'm going to highlight for you are just a few ways that I think of as a broad theme for our institute, which is how can science lead to the solutions that we need? So I'm going to highlight for you just a couple areas that we're working on right now where I think science is needed desperately to inform policy. And we heard a big uh, a piece of this from uh, uh, Ms. Anamoto uh, in focusing on 
uh, both the, the opioid issue and I would say broadly more in terms of comorbidity of how addictions and mental illnesses are related to one another. And these are places where I hope that we can bring the power of science to improve the outcomes of the patients that we all work with and serve. Our basic model at NIDA would be, uh, 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 first off, do we, do we pit biology against environment? No. We think of addiction as the product of the combination of innate biology, our innate genetic predispositions, in combination with environments. And environments can be thought of in very broad terms. That's everything from the early childhood environment of abuse and neglect, which can predispose people to change in the way they may respond to drugs when they're exposed to them as adolescents, to the family environment in early childhood and adolescence, to even something as broad as the culture, the laws and policies uh, that affect behavior in important ways. So it's important to think of this as not sort of pitting biology against environment, but thinking about the combination of how our brain reacts to environments in all the myriad ways as uh, something that we want to study. So we're interested in studying all the different aspects of the uh, uh, predisposition to drugs, to how drugs can uh, be better treated and impacted. Now, to further complicate this, we've been learning a great deal about neurodevelopment and about human development, and so we have to think about gene-environment interactions across age as the key factors in our models for understanding addiction, development, and intervention. So the three areas that I want to focus in seven minutes and 43 seconds are marijuana, the shifting legal landscape, and how important research is to inform these questions, e-cigarettes, uh, and this has been a remarkable shift in terms of how, what people are purchasing and using with almost no regulation of this uh, uh, marketing, and that plays a key role among all of our patients. And finally, of course, we'll focus on opioids as our current crisis in terms of an increasing overdose deaths, galvanizing tremendous legislative and policy actions. Now, when we think about marijuana, uh, this has been legalized uh, first for medical purposes by a number of states without any direct change in federal laws, although federal policy had shifted uh, in recent years uh, uh, to not enforce uh, federal laws as rigorously in the uh, medical marijuana states to allow states to experiment in some ways with these new laws. Now, what we've seen is an increase in marijuana use it's interesting to me because I expected that youth and very young people would be the most vulnerable to these changing policies and changing culture. We have seen a decrease in the perceptions of harm, and yet we haven't seen increases in marijuana use by teenagers. We are seeing market increases in uh, young adults and in older adults. So we are seeing an impact of this changing culture in terms of marijuana use in our country. Uh, we've. Uh, uh, just recently had data, I was, uh, had the pleasure of working with colleagues at SAMHSA to look at, well, how many people are using marijuana medically all across our country? It turns out you can use marijuana that's recommended by a clinician, both in states that have legalized it and those that have not. Overall, it's about 1.3% of the population, so it's not a huge percentage, and it's about 10% of all marijuana users report that it was recommended by a clinician. Uh, these people are very similar to marijuana misusers, so the distinctions between medical users and non-medical are not as clear-cut as the public might think. Now, can the cannabinoids in the marijuana plant be useful for medical purposes? Absolutely. Uh, and so there's a need to look at what are the components of the plant that might be useful for treating pain, for uh, treating childhood seizure disorder that's not responded to other, uh, other medications. These are some of the promising areas where we want to uh, encourage all of NIH researchers and certainly those at NIDA to help support this work. There was a recent report just uh, coming out of the Institute of Medicine that I encourage you to take a look at that has galvanized attention to these issues. All right, so that's number one, the importance of research to inform the policy developments in marijuana. Number two, this will be, this is a quick one, e-cigarettes. There's sort of two things going on here. I thought when we first started seeing these on the market, it's like, okay, it's not as harmful a way to ingest nicotine. You're boiling liquid, essentially, instead of burning something and putting smoke into your lungs. That just didn't, as a clinician, I'm going, that doesn't sound as risky to me. Well, the trade-offs for a confirmed heavy smoker to potentially switch make some reasonable sense. And we are, there is some evidence to suggest that e-cigarettes can be a useful product in certain, for some individuals that are trying to quit. 
On the other hand, what's emerged over the last uh, five years or so is that an awful lot of teenagers are starting out with e-cigarettes. In fact, more kids are starting out with e-cigarettes than regular combustible tobacco. That was really a surprise for us. And some of these uh, uh, youth are transitioning from e-cigarettes to combustible cigarettes. So this may, might represent a new pathway into a, a, a more typical and life-threatening uh, uh, pattern. Uh, it, it's not just e-cigarettes in general, but we're learning details like, is it flavorings that matter in this? And certainly, I'm not sure that there are that many adults that respond to tangerine, strawberry, uh, or bubblegum flavored uh, e-cigarette devices. So those kind of flavors, I think, are inherently designed to appeal to youth. In collaboration with uh, the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism and multiple other NIH institutes to respond to these questions about tobacco use and marijuana use and alcohol use among youth, we've launched the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study, which is in the field now, uh, recruiting nine and 10 year olds to do thorough, careful neuropsychiatric evaluations, including MRI scans. So we can get a baseline assessment prior to much exposure to substances and learn what these substances do to youth development. This we hope will really inform the field tremendously in the area of tobacco, marijuana, and alcohol policy and practice. All right, so that's number two. You can almost unbuckle your seatbelts now. Number three will be the opioid crisis. We've certainly seen these major increases in deaths. I would suggest to you it's three intersecting epidemics. If this had been a few years ago, uh, when I came to these meetings, I would talk just about prescription opioids. But starting in around 2007, and particularly in 2010, heroin deaths started, started increasing dramatically. Uh, we've actually seen a leveling off in the prescription-related deaths in the last couple of years, but I wouldn't say improvements, just a lack of continued increases. But coming on the heels of that is the uh, tremendous problems coming from fentanyl. And this is not the medical fentanyl that comes from uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry in this country, but is illicitly produced fentanyl shipped mostly from China and distributed directly using the mail and mail carriers or indirectly through Canada and Mexico. Uh, in addition to the overall rates, like other drugs, drug problems, these are not uniformly distributed around the country. So epidemics, you need to think about both the whole population and think about your local factors. So we see while there's an increase everywhere in the country in this epidemic, it's hit certain areas much more heavily than others. And that's typical for drugs, drugs of abuse, that there's variation across time and across space and geography. So what are we doing about this? Well. Uh, uh, from SAMHSA, we heard about the 21st Century Cures Act. I will say I'm very pleased that NIDA will be uh, uh, soliciting applications, and we're already open for business. If you have ideas, please send them to me. But we hope to have and expect to have a specific solicitation to encourage research that uh, uh, allows, that encourages researchers to collaborate with states to test novel ideas within the context of the expanded treatment services in the uh, 21st Century Cures funding. We've also launched a rural initiative. The r opioid issue has particularly hit rural areas very hard. Well, providing services and intervention to rural areas is not so easy to do. So in collaboration with SAMHSA and the CDC, we've launched a, uh, an initiative that right now we've got the applications in-house and we're looking at which ones we might be able to fund in the next uh, couple of months to uh, come up with comprehensive uh, programs to address the population impact of opioids in rural areas. When we think about the priority areas, we think about prevention, about distribution of naloxone and medication-assisted treatment. We're certainly very proud of our work in the area of naloxone uh, 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 distribution and development, uh, both in terms of working to see to it that naloxone is distributed to patients who uh, are at risk for overdose, there was a wonderful poster about uh, naloxone distribution to methadone patients and showing that the FZO device could lead to saving lives, uh, a large number of lives, by distributing it to those patients. I'm sort of surprised that that's not universal common practice in all our drug treatment. It's not necessarily the patient in front of us that's gonna be the one saved by those devices, but they're in social networks that have a lot of other people using drugs. So even if it doesn't save the patient to whom it's prescribed, there'll be others that it can save their lives. We've been working on new medications, and I know you all are familiar with the Probifene implants. Uh, uh, that was started with some funding uh, a number of years ago from NIDA to help test these in a large-scale clinical trial, and we're very pleased that it was approved last year. 
I'd say it's not just developing new medications, but making sure that they're implemented in practice that's been a key challenge to all of us. There's a wonderful study by Gail D'Onofrio and Yale that showed that emergency departments that start buprenorphine on site at the time of the intervention can get people more engaged in treatment. Now, we're not quite sure about the long-term outcomes and long-term implications, but at least short-term, this can be a, 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 light, a beginning of a life-changing uh, approach to better implementation of medication-assisted treatment. So in about now 11 minutes, not 10, what I've, I hope I've highlighted for you is how science can lead to solutions to address the myriad policy and practice issues that address our field. And that's what we are all about, is trying to answer some of the questions you may have uh, with approaches that you can implement in your practices. Thanks very much. So uh, Ms. Enomoto had to just leave, so the questions will be for the uh, remaining two. But I want to thank you, Dr. Compton. Thanks very much. Um, I want to thank you for your perspectives from NIDA. Um, I would like to present you with this plaque, and thank you for participating in our annual conference. So please join me once again in thanking our federal agency leaders for their leadership in the field of addiction medicine. And now we're going to open up for some questions. Uh, we'll try to spread them around. So first for George, um, restricting access to tobacco through taxes and smoking restrictions has been working. Are there any efforts to change policy like that for alcohol? Policy changes about um, taxing, increasing taxing, or any other ways of making the use of alcohol safer? We don't do policy at NIAAA is the short answer. We provide the evidence-based information for policy changes. You make the policy changes by voting. <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, no, no. <laughs> um, uh, is there any consideration to change NIDA's name to reflect more accurate terminology? Uh, at the present time, we're not. Uh, and just, we're not thinking about spending scarce political capital on a name change when there's so many other issues that, that our field needs to address. We did try that a number of years ago, and it, it didn't go anywhere. So we will probably not try to do that at the present time. We'll go back and forth. Can you speak more about NIAAA's efforts to improve medical education and addiction? Uh, is there ways to support addiction medicine fellowships now that addiction medicine is ABMS recognized? Um, we have an active program uh, led by Peggy Murray at our institute in collaboration with Jack Stein at NIDA on this very issue. And so there's a number of things being discussed, including one that is to use the Surgeon General's report as a launch pad for a possible framework for a curriculum, also working with uh, ASAM on further fellowships and how the fellowships can be used. I call it the trickle-down approach to uh, teach residents. I'm also in favor of, of, uh, of an approach from the bottom up to see if we can get more uh, in the exams in medical school, more in the curriculum in medical schools. Um, and these efforts are ongoing. We, we've had two meetings at the executive building of the White House, and I think there's <laughs> another one possibly being considered or planned in, in this regard. So it's, a, it's an active effort. Anybody with suggestions, we're happy to entertain them. About funding of the fellowships, I don't know, I truthfully don't know where we're at with that. I don't know whether you guys have even come around to sending in a grant application, but um, there are, it's a vehicle for getting funding, so. I'd want to add a little bit to this. This is a shared area where uh, NIDA and NIAAA work together all the time, uh, and uh, I, I, I want to say there was a wonderful poster out there where the group in Boston at Harvard in collaboration with Tufts and BU and UMass had really uh, been working from a medical student perspective to demand changes in the curriculum. And that's an interesting perspective that it may be the students that can drive some of this change rather than the entrenched faculty. Yeah, and it includes not only 
teaching medical students on pain management, but also on addiction management. And, and, Absolutely. And we're putting both together, and we're focusing on both together. This is a question for both of you. Um, how are the proposed budget cuts, how do you see them affecting your research programs? Uh, well, clearly we don't know how our budget will turn out. Uh, the budget starts out with a proposal from the White House and then is appropriated in Congress. Uh, there is no way to have a shrinking budget and not shrink your portfolio. There's sort of a, however much you have to spend is how much we will be able to do. So uh, we certainly are, are, are pay paying attention to this. And what I can say is that no matter what our budget is, we will work as hard as we can to make sure that we use those dollars to maximize our impact on the health of the populations that we serve. That we will always have uh, opportunities to uh, conduct research that will have an impact on every one of your practices, and that's what we will continue to strive to do no matter how, uh, no matter how the budget turns out. I could not have said it better. <laughs> I'm gonna, Wilson, Wilson's been there longer than me, so. I'll say it a little bit differently, and I say this to all the ASAM members, I think Dr. Compton just said it, the government does not hand down the money. The voters have to understand they are the ones who vote on handing down the money, ASAM members are those of us in the room who are members. They're not the board of directors and the officers. So we have to speak loudly. Some of us got very nervous last fall with the new administration being elected. That means we have to speak up. As a Zen Buddhist, I will say we're all part of one and the same mind, which means Whatever we say is all part of the same mind. So speak loudly and follow Joseph Green's comments this morning. We always appreciate a loud voice from the uh, treating and public communities. Next question. The next epidemic seems to be misuse of benzodiazepines. What research is NIDA doing on benzodiazepine misuse and treatment? I think that's a terrific question. Uh, I, I, when we look at the opioid overdose epidemic, we see that it's not just opioids by themselves, but the combination of opioids with other substances, benzodiazepines being among them, but I think there are questions about how opioids overlap with other substances as well. Uh, it's not been an area that has been as active an area of research uh, in, in recent years, uh, and so as you all have ideas for how we might augment this portfolio with some new, new questions, I'd be very curious to hear your best thoughts. It's certainly one we share with the yeah. Alcohol Institute. When you look at how benzodiazepines interact with alcohol and are a key part of uh, the treatment of alcohol use disorders, certainly withdrawal anyway. Okay. Yeah, I mean, th they are abused n not only by individuals with alcohol use disorders, but now with opiate use disorder as, as a, as a sometimes, in, in multiple ways. So it is a concern on, and it's something we, we both, both institutes could easily work together on. I, think I, might, I might add, just a factoid, is that we, we estimate that about 15% of opiate overdoses involve um, sedative hypnotics like alcohol. And, and if, if you remember your pharmacology, Two plus two equals five. This is a, a general question. Is there any push or impetus to make naloxone over the counter? Uh, there certainly has been interest in the community uh, for making it over the counter. It, it's not a matter of just sort of waving a magic wand and it becomes over the counter. Uh, there's a whole process that our, uh, uh, the Food and Drug Administration has to move medications from prescription to over the counter. I will say in many states and locations, naloxone occupies a pretty special place in that there are standing orders. I didn't show you the policy map because there's not enough time. But there's an interesting uh, a set of uh, uh, policies where many states now have standing orders, often by like the leading by the state physician. I was just in Pennsylvania and Dr. Levine in Pennsylvania. You can go into any pharmacy in Pennsylvania and say, 
Dr. Levine has written an order for me to get naloxone. So it's sort of pseudo over the counter or sort of behind the counter, but easy access through those uh, inter interventions. Uh, and I'm not sure whether there will be a sponsor to bring it uh, to consideration for over the counter uh, uh, release, but that certainly is a possibility. This is a question that could have been from me because uh, I'm an advocate for this. Is there any effort to move from SBIRT in primary care to SBIT, or I usually say SIT, which means taking out the referral, and use the framework to have patients with uh, disease to be treated in primary care? Well, we know that, that uh, without the referral, it's very effective. And so there's a lot of emphasis in NIAAA now in focusing on just the uh, brief intervention. Uh, I, and you're an expert in this area, so. I think it's been a complicated set of questions for the illicit drug field. Uh, and so where do we find a role for screening? Uh, for screening and, and treatment access itself, I think there, there are cl clear roles for case identification and intervening. The role for brief interventions when it comes to illicit drugs is certainly uh, uh, remains a thorny question and unproven in many ways. Uh, there's sort of mixed evidence at best, and the largest uh, uh, trials don't show an impact of brief interventions on illicit drug use by itself. But I do think the question is how can we package these so that, so that uh, addiction issues will be better addressed in general medicine? That remains a major uh, theme uh, for our development and, and practice development that I know all of you all are interested in. Yeah, and let me just emphasize that, that uh, brief interventions do work in, in alcohol use disorders for adults, and we have pretty good evidence beginning to be published that they're also effective in adolescents. Uh, this has been a repeated question probably. Do NIDA and NIAAA support uh, treatment methodologies that, not that do not use medication? Oh, absolutely. I, I, you all have heard me say this before. I consider medications hamburger helper. Um, so I, I think the real treatments for me are the behavioral treatments. They're very effective. Um, we, are, we still have a portfolio in developing refinements or better behavioral treatments, and I'm sure NIDA does as well. Well, of course we do. We're very proud and pleased with the development of contingency management, of cognitive behavioral approaches, of family-based treatment approaches that have been useful, proving useful for adolescent drug-related issues as well as adult issues across a range of substances. Uh, they are the mainstay of sort of our evidence-based treatment approaches in the field. A key question is how do we go from their proof of, of, of concept to their widespread implementation? And that hasn't been as easy to figure out. And I, and I do think that's where we continue to look for ways, can we use technology to expand their reach? Uh, how do we make sure that there's adequate supervision? Behavioral interventions don't sort of take care of themselves. They need proper supervision and implementation to have the impact that, that you want them to have. Those are some of the key questions that we're, we're currently uh, struggling with. I I'll also will say that it's not just medications. We're also interested in transcranial magnetic stimulation, for example, as a possible approach to uh, addressing uh, substance use issues. Has NIDA started contracting with more marijuana growers for research now that the DEA, I'm sorry, the DEA has allowed it? Uh, so far, there is one and only uh, contracted group to grow marijuana for research in the United States. And that's the group at the University of Mississippi. The question was, is there going to be a, a, some way for a research application process that will not be overly cumbersome? Uh, well, the cumbersome nature is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, some people think a rigorous, careful uh, vetting process is, should be the case. The question is, how cumbersome is too much? Uh, we certainly think that minimizing the burden so that research can be duct conducted in an effective, efficient way is in everybody's best interest. And uh, we are uh, working with our colleagues at the DEA to see what we can do to reduce some of the regulatory burdens. We don't write the laws, we live within the laws. So when there are smart ideas that can help improve uh, uh, legitimate access to substances so that they can be tested carefully in uh, uh, medical trials so that we can have medications brought to market that are proven to be effective, uh, we think we're all in favor of that. 
I think was interesting. Is how, how do the two of you with your agencies coordinate your portfolios? We have a joint NIAAA NIDA Council, which is going to occur on the 3rd of May, and we do it once a year. And we are charged with what's called the Collaborative Research on Addictions at NIH, which involves our institute, NIDA, and the National Cancer Institute with their tobacco portfolio. And that is a very active program, and a committee meets on a very regular basis, I think monthly, to coordinate our portfolios on uh, joint activities in those areas. And you may want to add something, Wilson. I'd like to add that I, I think it's a matter of both the structures and the organizational principles that, that uh, Dr. Koob just mentioned, as well as the informal interactions among staff and making sure that we promote uh, collaborations at a staff level uh, and so that, you know, I, I constantly help George with administrative issues within NIAAA. His staff are constantly helping our team at NIDA. That's a way that we promote interactions so that we are aware of the key issues that each other is working on. So that where, there's an, where there is an opportunity for collaboration, for instance, in medical education, we can do that together. Instead of each of us trying to invent the wheel, we can do it jointly. Uh, at the same time, we try to maintain some distance where there are key differences in terms of the research that's important to each agency and try to make sure that we encourage people to go to the right funder for their particular questions. This concludes the question and answer session. Thank you for submitting great questions for our agency leaders. So I want to thank our speakers. I want to thank Dr. Fingerhood for the moderating the questions. And this concludes our first National Perspective plenary session. Hope you enjoyed the session and please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>